Hi, my name is Alvin Loke. Today I will be uh, discussing uh, advanced CMOS impact on analog mix signal design. So the mobile SOC has become the driver for CMOS scaling in recent years. As you can tell from the plot here, uh, Moore's Law is still quite alive and well. Uh, with seven nanometer smartphone products already uh, available in the market uh, in late, as of late 2018, and also five nanometer uh, smartphone products are currently in risk production. Now, SOC technology is driven by the economics of logic and SRAM scaling. And uh, to uh, justify a new node, it needs to uh, offer sufficient power performance and area benefit. Now with this, uh, the feature size has only been incrementally uh, being reduced, while most of the area reduction has come from extensive logic and SRAM design technology co-optimization. With that said, analog mixed signal uh, subsystems are ubiquitous in SOCs. Things such as PLL, wireline IOs, ESD regulators, data converters, band gap reference, and so forth are all absolutely critical components of an SOC. And yet the device palette we use to actually design these components is largely slave to the logic offering. With that said, I'm going to cover technology scaling enablers and also uh, cover the uh, design impact and strategies uh, uh, related, uh, imposed by these technology uh, scaling enablers and quickly wrap up. So I'll cover technology scaling enablers, which will include FinFETs, uh, lithography, mechanical stressors, high K metal gate, as well as middle end of line. In moving to smaller and smaller transistors, it's all about uh, how do we improve um, short channel gate control. Uh, the key thing to realize is in order to turn off a transistor, turn off and on a transistor, you have to realize that the transistor is essentially, a MOSFET is essentially a bipolar junction transistor in subthreshold operation, where the base is essentially a, uh, a surface potential, phi sub s, which is controlled by a capacitive divider between C ox, the oxide capacitance, uh, as well as in, in, in series with uh, the body coupling uh, CB and drain coupling CD. Now with a fully depleted FinFET, we can actually have this architecture reduce both CB and CD, and the reduced body and drain coupling results in steeper subthreshold swing, drain-induced barrier lowering, and body effect. And the net benefit of this is actually substantial reduction in uh, the reduction of the supply voltage that's used to power on these circuits for a given ion and I off of the transistor. So this takes us to the fully depleted tri-fet, a uh, tri-gate FinFET. So what are the benefits of this? Well, for one, the obvious one is you obviously get more on current and as a result, more GM per unit area, projected area onto the wafer die, because we're essentially uh, amplifying the effective width of a transistor without into the third dimension, uh, normal to the wafer, without increasing um, area. The fin dimensions are fixed in terms of height and width, and therefore the uh, fin um, width, the effective width offered per fin is quantized. Now this is a challenge for SRAM and anal uh, logic, but not so for analog, because the transistor GMs are generally very small per fin given the very low overdrive that we use given the constrained supply voltage we typically need to design under. Okay. Now obviously there's less dibble in these transistors, which results in higher R out and uh, higher intrinsic gain. As, uh, as would be expected, the body effect is almost negligible and uh, the random open fluctuation mismatch is actually improved, leading to better transistor uh, reduced mismatch. With that said though, it does come with a set of uh, bad news. So parasitics are the notable ones when you're trying to cram everything in a 3D structure. The source strain resistance is substantially higher leading to uh, um, significant source strain degener degeneration. This is a huge deal. Turns out also the coupling from the source strain to the gate is quite high. And lastly, because the fin width is much, much less than the fin pitch uh, between fins, uh, it means that the junction capacitance, albeit quite low, does result in very high well access resistance. And this has implications, which I'll discuss later. So looking at foundry pitch scaling, uh, basically, you can see that compared to the uh, historical 0.7 uh, times uh, uh, um, uh, um, scaling factor for every two years from node to node, the scaling rate has actually fallen uh, uh, below the 0.7x per node. And so uh, really the node name is more than, is really more of a marketing number for equivalent power performance in area. Uh, this is largely because extreme ultraviolet has been late to production, only starting at seven nanometers. With that said, in order to achieve sub 80 nanometer pitch, 
this has resulted in uh, um, some lithography innovations, uh, as well as which results in process complexity and cost to achieve such, such uh, um, scaling. One such lithography innovation is pitch splitting. So here, what we're trying to achieve is to interleave two or more exposures uh, printed with a pitch uh, that is uh, achievable with conventional 193 nanometer immersion lithography. And uh, this has a complexity of decomposing the mass and having color balance and so forth. The limitation with this technique, as would be expected, is the overlay or misalignment between the mass. Another technique that's been very commonly used is orthogonal cutting, where an extra mask or two would be introduced to break line patterns to reduce the line end-to-end -end spacing. Now this uh, works because the cut mask uh, pattern, the ends of the cut mask patterns where you'll have rounding due to near field diffraction effects uh, will not be seen in the final printed pattern. However, with this problem, with this uh, technique, once again, you're also limited by mask, uh, cut mask uh, overlay. So this has obviously given rise to a host of um, self-aligned or misalignment insensitive uh, patterning schemes. So one such scheme, which is commonly used for patterning fins, uh, um, uh, and also now increasingly common for patterning short channel gates, the middle end of line, as well as the lower back end of line layers, is the use of uh, uh, spacer-based patterning. So here you have a mandrel which you print with a single exposure. You then deposit spacers on the sidewall of each mandrel, remove the mandrel, leaving behind twice as many spacers as you have mandrel, and therefore pitch that's half of that of the mandrel. If you want to achieve lower than 40 nanometers, uh, fin pitch, for instance, then you recursively apply this technique where what you do is you use your spacer ones as your mandrel for spacer two, deposit spacer twos, then remove spacer one, leaving behind four times as many uh, uh, spacers as you have mandrel. You can, in addition, use a block mask in conjunction with self-aligned double or quadrature patterning. Uh, and what this does is by using variable width space mandrels uh, and using block masks to bridge between uh, consecutive or a contiguous uh, uh, spacers, you can actually achieve flexible width in space. Another technique that's uh, become been, been quite commonly used since 19 nanometers is mechanical stressors for boosting the mobility of the transistors. As we all know, silicon is piezo-resistive, which means that you can change the um, electrical properties by uh, inducing mechanical strain. And this is primarily along the channel length where in, intentional surrounding stressors are applied to improve the transistor mobility. The uh, technique uh, requires typically tension for NMOS and compression for PMOS. However, the reality is much more complicated given the 3D nature of the FinFET and different uh, uh, orientations of the Fin uh, uh, channel. Uh, this is definitely far more effective for PMOS and this has resulted in the beta ratios or the relative strength from between NMOS and PMOS to approach near parity. Um, however, uh, the technique is primarily used for effective for a short channel where the effect actually gets attenuated for longer channel effects, uh, longer channel dev devices. Now, the problem with uh, mechanical stressors is that the mobility does depend on all sorts of geometric parameters such as the, uh, um, the diffusion length, the diffusion width, as well as the space to the surrounding diffusion. And this gives rise to a host of layout dependent effects, which are modeled, but uh, does cause uh, 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 simulation discrepancies between pre and post layout. Uh, another technique that's used to uh, um, scale transistors is the use of high K and metal gate dielectrics, uh, a, a gate for a higher oxide capacitance. Here, the point is to reduce the uh, direct gate tunneling leakage as well as to uh, uh, mitigate uh, poly depletion. Uh, we are using a replacement metal gate integration scheme for a stable VT because uh, the high K metal gate interface is thermally very delicate. Uh, and this has resulted in the use of uh, uh, tuning transistor VTs using a metal gate stack compositions as well as high K dielectric dipoles, um, which unlike implants uh, uh, allows uh, the device variation to be uh, quite a bit lower. Uh, one of the consequences though with this technique, uh, this uh, using high K metal gates is that because the gates are very narrow, naturally the gate resistance is very high. And furthermore, due to integration uh, um, requirements with the psilocyte last integration, the source strain resistance is also higher. So this moves us to the middle end of line, which is really the contact module and the rise of uh, the usage of self-aligned contacts. So the problem with having transistors on a very tight contact to gate pitch is it's very tough to land diffusion and gate contacts without shorts between the two. And this is typically where uh, yield is problematic in uh, early uh, yield ramp up. So looking uh, historically at 28 nanometers and earlier, we would have only uh, one 
uh, masks to define both diffusion and gate contacts. Here, we have a much more complicated scheme where um, we have basically uh, um, dielectric caps, for instance, to protect uh, uh, against uh, misaligned contacts. Uh, and so here you've got dielectric, gate dielectric caps to um, protect against the self-aligned contact. And we also uh, build this contact dielectric cap, which protects against the self-aligned via uh, and gate contact. Uh, and, and so moving forward, actually, self-gate contacts are going to be uh, um, uh, quite a new thing and very, very powerful for reducing standard cell area, where we can actually land the gate contacts directly over the diffusion as opposed to being restricted to landing the contacts in the gate overhang. Now, the problem with this uh, uh, middle end of line scheme now, which is far more complex than what we have seen historically, is that we have plenty more interfaces uh, between different contacts and metals, and, and, and this has resulted in substantially higher resistance in both the source strain, middle end of line, and the lower back end of line. So moving on to design impact and strategies, here's uh, one very, very common construct that's used. Uh, because we are limited in the channel length of the transistor to a very sh relatively short LMAX due to uh, etch and litho loading effects as well as uh, the CMP of the replacement gate module, it's uh, very, very common now to use stack vet topology where we would basically short uh, have several contiguous devices, uh, short channel devices, and where the gate's shorted. So the nice thing about using short channels is that the mobility boost is substantially higher here, and this could potentially reduce uh, result, result in less area if you have multiple fingers. The problem with this uh, usage of stack gates is that you have intermediate diffusions, uh, which basically serve as high frequency capacitive shorts of AC current. And therefore, you can see from the plot on the right that uh, as you go to higher and higher frequency, using a stack of LMIN devices compared to an LMAX device could actually result in a roll off of the uh, high frequency output resistance, which can result in great gain degradation, common mode rejection uh, degradation, and so forth. In terms of uh, uh, some of the other, another implication of this technology uh, using um, the short channel transistor, where short channel transistors are patterned using self line double patterning and long channel transistors are patterned using a conventional second mask, is that uh, is an example here with a current mirror where we have enabled devices typically uh, used to turn on and off the transistors. The problem with self aligned double patterning is it's very, very prone to loading effects. And so uh, it's not good to have a mix of long and short channel effects. It uh, is preferred to actually uh, um, convert, for instance, your short channel enabled transistor, long channel transistors, or even more preferred to actually convert your long channel transistors into uh, a stack of short channel transistors, keeping consistency in channel lengths. With that said, uh, another technique that's become very, very popular and common now is the use of a continuous diffusion for performance and matching. So here what we do is we would bolt on a, uh, um, uh, a set of dummies to the ends of a long diffusion to basically build up a stress plateau for higher mobility and desensitize the FET from mobility variation, for instance, you would see in a short OD. This uh, is a particular, uh, uh, very, very common strategy for matching, but does come with the penalty of adding the dummies to build up the stress plateau. What perhaps the most uh, uh, notable aspect of designing in a FinFET uh, node is uh, parasitic resistance. Here is an example where the, the high parasitic resistance in the source strain contacts uh, is especially challenging for high current circuits such as IO drivers and uh, clock buffers. So one very common technique, for instance, is to use a double source layout where we basically insert a dummy gate in between to land contacts, uh, more an additional contact to basically split the current and therefore half the uh, contact resistance. The back end also, in particular the lower layers, uh, parasitic resistance is particularly prevalent where tight pitch is extremely critical for dense logic connectivity and error reduction. The problem with copper interconnects is that uh, the barrier is not scaling with metal pitch uh, and the combination of that with surface and grain boundary scattering has given rise to a substantial increase in the normalized resistance of the metal lines uh, as we scale the metal pitch. Parasitic capacitance is uh, we would expect is also a lot worse with things being a lot more uh, nodes uh, being in a lot more closer proximity to one another. So the source strain trench contacts uh, and the gate form actually vertical parallel plate capacitor. And uh, here are two examples where, for instance, the gate to drain capacitance and the gate source capacitance 
can actually worsen the uh, tr uh, of a circuit performance, say in a uh, um, low dropout regulator where the supply rejection is quite a bit worse, as well as, for instance, an example where you have an LPDDR receiver where kickback noise due to the gate to source coupling can actually corrupt the, uh, uh, for instance, a common voltage reference that's used to slice the uh, 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 signal input. Uh, thick oxide transistors are also a big uh, uh, um, concern in these new nodes. Uh, historically, uh, and we still continue to use uh, 1.8 volt swing general purpose IOs, despite the reduced core voltage uh, supply for uh, reduced power, uh, because these uh, uh, high performance ICs need to talk with uh, peripheral ICs that's made in lower cost uh, uh, nodes. Uh, it is increasingly difficult to uh, keep these uh, 1.8 volt IO devices largely because as a fin pitch is being reduced or scaled, it's tougher to do the gate fill uh, in a replacement metal gate scheme. Also, level shifters are increasingly tough to bridge a larger uh, delta uh, VDD between a lower core voltage and uh, um, 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 a, 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 a IO voltage that's remained the same. Going to passives, we have resistors here. So the uh, most common resistor that's used for precision applications is the uh, um, is a metal middle end of line thin film resistor. Here it's used because the poly resistor has become obsolete in migrating to a high K metal gate integration scheme. The problem with the um, uh, this particular resistor is that uh, because we have variation concerns uh, when we scale the area too much, it limits analog scaling. Capacitors, uh, pretty much same fare. However, because the pitch scaling is substantially uh, um, uh, better in the lower back end of line, there's higher capacitance density, but because of higher parasitic, uh, if you use AC coupling capacitors, the efficiency of that coupling is reduced. And uh, also we do still use uh, accumulation mode reactors for supply decoupling, as well as, uh, um, uh, for instance, oscillator tuning. Inductors, uh, we continue to use the upper back end of line layers. However, uh, um, uh, there is a small impact from scaling due to stricter uh, uh, density fill requirements and therefore lower uh, inductor Q. Uh, moving on to diodes and bipolars, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the higher well access resistance has resulted in strict, stricter well tie density guard ring as well as latch up rules and, uh, um, uh, and also the higher uh, diode or BJT series resistance uh, essentially leads uh, to a uh, reduced window of current where you can actually bias your band gap reference and thermal sensors. So I'll now move quickly uh, to lay out considerations, floor plan considerations. In these nodes, the DRCs are extremely tough. What the rules want is basically logic arrays, and therefore we really want our analog mix signal layout to resemble logic as much as possible. There are enormous number of very strict density checks to basically reduce the long range pattern density uh, and therefore long, uh, long range pattern variation. And this results in substantial rework actually of smaller cells if you're not careful. If you look at, for instance, floor planning is substantially more tedious and bloated where you have more dummy gates, well taps, guard rings and so forth. And also, if you're not careful with uh, densities uh, um, next to each other, you might actually require to waste a lot of space to have transitions inserted between different device types and pattern densities. With that said, it is not uh, surprising that um, coming up with the usage of analog cells can provide for much more efficient analog design, where basically what you do is you construct cells that have technology awareness for faster design closure. You can incorporate layout considerations such as process-friendly guidelines, um, anticipate density concerns, um, have predominant use of short channel transistors uh, to emulate long channel transistors, uh, and so forth, uh, and uh, uh, include middle end of line and lower back end of line uh, uh, into these cells for easier assembly. You can also have schematic considerations to reduce the pre to post layout simulation discrepancies, anticipate layout dependent effects, for instance, such as uh, a continuous OD placement as well as back annotated parasitics because you already have uh, some of the uh, uh, low level wiring aren't included. With that said, I'd like to conclude. Um, so clearly, as you can tell, analog mixed signal design in the remaining CMOS nodes is very tedious. As you can tell, it's largely about understanding the technology and seeing how the technology is imposing non-idealities and dealing with these non-idealities. Analog mixed signal scaling is not uh, scaling as, uh, um, as nicely as the roughly 0.5x uh, for logic and SRAM. Uh, it's scaling typically no better than 10 to 20% with each node. This is largely uh, and, uh, due to uh, parasitics and layout dependent effects also, which will get worse and ultimately leave it scaling. 
However, the, given that, if we make and design more digital friendly uh, analog mix signal designs, you can get new performance power integration levels. The only difference is that you have to sweat a lot more to get there. Thank you.